Which of these two messages would you rather hear? Here's the first one. You are doing great. Your wife, your life is a wonderful example of faith and faithfulness. By the way that you live, we can see that you clearly love God and you love others. Just keep on doing what you're doing. Or then there's this message. You are messing up. You've turned your mind and your heart and your life against God. In fact, you're engaging in conduct that is immoral and unethical and ungodly. And as a result, you're going to face some dire consequences. And you'll only avoid these consequences if you change and humble yourself before God. Now, I think the answer to my question is obvious. We, we all would vastly prefer the first message. And there are times when we might actually deserve to hear a message like that. Yet there are times when what we need most is to hear that second message. And issuing messages like that was the role of a biblical prophet. Every prophet was asked by God to give God's people a huge dose of tough love by delivering an unwanted, unpopular, yet vitally needed message. And every prophecy in the Bible is a variation on a theme, and the ultimate response always boils down to this. You need to change and humble yourself before God. Change. Humble yourself before God. That's a message proud and stubborn people don't want to hear. Proud people don't like to admit that they might be wrong. Stubborn people don't like to admit that they might need to change. The reality is that we like our independence and we like fooling ourselves with the idea that we know better than God how to run our lives. And so in most cases, the last thing that anyone wants to hear is the prophetic call to humility. Messages from a number of prophets are recorded for us in the Bible. They all wrote a long time ago. And yet their messages still are highly relevant today because human nature simply doesn't change. Societies change. Cultures change. Values change. Morals change. Technologies change. Standards of living change. But, but basic human nature is amazingly consistent across the centuries. Consistent in ways both good and bad. And one of the consistent problems of humanity is that we rebel against our creator. We rebel because of our pride and our selfishness and our stubbornness. We rebel because we're not humble. And it's in moments like that when God's people need to hear some words of tough love that call us back to God. And we find such a message from God recorded for us in the book of Micah, chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. And that's where we will turn our attention this morning. Micah writes words that were given to him by God, and his, here is what he says to the people of God. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear you mountains the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, and Aaron, and Miriam. My people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted, and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. Micah is asked by God to produce these words because the people have come to believe that their ways are better than God's ways. They believe that a life of selfish indulgence 
is better than a life of godly humility. Yet that is the pathway toward self-destruction. God wants to rescue his children from themselves. And so here he calls them to account. And he challenges them because in a very real sense, they have put God on trial. Whenever we elevate our judgment above the judgment of God, we're putting him on trial. And God makes this clear by the way he responds here to his rebellious people. He presents his arguments as if he's pleading a case in court. He calls the elements of creation to stand as witnesses and to serve as the jury. And obviously the mountains and the hills and the earth can't, can't actually do that. It's just a symbolic way to remind the Israelites that God is the creator. And they are not. In other words, it is the height of arrogance for any human to act as if we can judge God. Now, there certainly are times when we may think we have a legitimate complaint against God. After all, there are those times when we're not happy because God doesn't remove the, the problems and the burdens and the hardships of life in ways that we would prefer. Yet the reality is, who are we as mere mortals to question our Creator? As I think of what Micah writes here, I'm reminded of that moment when Job stood before God. And Job was questioning the hardships of his life. And God said to Job, where were you when I made the world? You see, the first step toward a proper sense of humility is to recognize the gulf between humans as created beings and God as the creator. And yet what's heartwarming is even as God highlights this huge gap between us, his goal is not to separate himself from his people. He loves his people. They're close to his heart. And that's why he continually showers them with care as he describes here in four specific examples. It was God who rescued Israel from slavery in Egypt and set them free. It was God who provided them with a series of, of leaders such as Moses and Aaron and Miriam. God protected them from the evil kings and false prophets of other nations, people like Balak and Balaam. And it was God who kept his people safe by taking them across the river Jordan and along the road from Shittim to Gilgal. And the bottom line here is that God watches over his people. He always is faithful. Now, does this mean that every Israelite enjoyed a pain-free, problem-free life? Of course not. We know that when the Israelites left Egypt behind and walked to the promised land that people got sore feet and aching calves. Some people probably got blisters. A few people might even have twisted their ankles. At times people had to deal with illness and sickness along the way. And I know human nature, so I know that husbands and wives squabbled with each other. I know that friends had arguments. God's care does not eliminate the normal travails of life. And just because we experience such things does not give us the right to put God on trial. We have problems in life for two primary reasons, neither one of which is God's fault. One reason is that we live in a broken world where bad things can happen and do happen. And the other reason is that often we are our own worst enemies. So many of our problems are the result of our own bad decision making, our own selfishness, our foolish behavior. And yet because of stubbornness and pride, we prefer to blame other people or blame God for our problems. It reminds me of a guy I used to know. Over a decade, Fred had a series of relationships with women, and all of them ended badly. And Fred always blamed the women. 
One time Fred was complaining about this to another friend named Tom. And Tom practiced some tough love. And he said, Fred, the common denominator in all of your unsuccessful relationships is you. You see, Fred failed relationally, yet he refused to humble himself and examine his own life. And instead, he blamed the women. He put them on trial. And we fail in all kinds of ways. And we refuse to humble ourselves and we blame God and we put him on trial. What Micah is telling here, us here is that when we do this, it is a display of incredible arrogance. So this part of Micah's prophecy is designed to get the people of God to feel at least a little bit sheepish. And to realize that they have been way too cocky. These words from Micah are designed to prepare the people of God so they can be willing to embrace humility. And so Micah now shifts his focus. Up to now he's been speaking on behalf of God. And in the next part of the prophecy he's going to speak on behalf of the people. And he's going to address a key question. What does God expect of me as his child. Let's look and see what Micah says. Verse 6. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? What Micah wants to do here is to highlight the fact that the children of God don't understand the heart of God. A sacrificial offering is supposed to be the outward act of a humble, contrite, repentant heart. And tragically, the Israelites have lost sight of that. And they have come to view the offering of sacrifice as sufficient in and of itself, regardless of their attitude toward God or the way they treat other people. And so they can be cocky and selfish and arrogant and rude and unrepentant, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter as long as they show up at the temple and make those sacrifices. In other words... My offering, in this case, is not a sign that I want to humble myself before God and get right with him. My sacrifice is just a way to appease God. And if a sacrifice is to appease God, if that's its purpose, then why not just give him more? If God likes me to take one sacrificial ram and offer it at the temple, why not give him a thousand? If he wants me to bring one jar of precious oil to the temple, why not bring him a river full? In fact, why not offer my own child as a sacrifice? It's ludicrous. And that's precisely Micah's point. God's people have their priorities completely wrong. And these words are here not just for them, but for us. Because we need to be careful not to make the same tragic mistake. God asks us to make different kinds of sacrifices than he did of Israel. And yet we can still misuse those sacrifices that we offer God. We might paraphrase Micah's words for us this way. Shall I throw a few more dollars in the offering? or attend church more often, or perhaps even give every single spare hour I have to serve as a volunteer. You see, whether we offer our time, or our money, or ourselves, we can't approach giving as a way to appease God. Because if I adopt this approach, my focus is not really on getting right with God. My focus is getting God off my back. And it's an insult to our creator. It displays a remarkable lack of humility. 
Micah wants us to understand that just increasing our offerings, just sacrificing more, is not the way to put things right. So what then is the answer? Well, Micah is now going to switch his focus again. And once more, he's going to speak to the people on behalf of God. And in this last part of the prophecy that we'll see today, Micah makes God's expectations crystal clear. Verse 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Now, I find it interesting that Micah introduces this conclusion to this part of the prophecy by referring to us as mortals. Some Bible translations use the word man in reference to mankind, but I I think the word mortal captures the meaning better because it emphasizes that this is a message from the immortal God given to mortal human beings. It reminds us once again that he's the creator. And we're not. We are mortals. And what God wants from us mortals is three distinct things. Rather than keep a checklist of what sacrifices we've made or not made, God asks us to embrace a humble lifestyle. A lifestyle where he comes first. A lifestyle which reflects justice and mercy flow out of humility. As I think about what God is asking of us here, I have to say that it's sad, tragically sad, that God has to urge his people to be just in their dealings with others. You'd think that God's people would naturally want to promote justice, to personally be treating other people with fairness and impartiality and to promote a world where that happens, but they don't. And in fact, at the time Micah writes these words, justice has largely disappeared from Israel. The operating rules of society are heavily tilted in favor of the rich and the powerful and the politically connected. And why does that happen? It happens because it's so easy for us to be selfish and prideful and to think more of ourselves than we do of others, to focus on getting what we want and not worry about how it impacts others. A lack of justice grows when there's no humility before God. And the history of humanity is a history, unfortunately, of injustice. And injustice occurs in a variety of ways in virtually every society in history. And it occurs in our world today. And it occurs, at least in part, Because we don't tend to view justice through the lens of biblical truth. We tend to view justice as either a legal issue or a political issue. Now justice certainly has legal and political implications. But justice goes beyond that. It goes deeper than that. Justice ultimately is a matter of the heart. When I act justly, I'm living with humility before God and making every effort to treat others fairly. Treating others as I would want to be treated if I was in their place. Justice is a very complex issue. So we're going to dig into it more deeply at some point during this year. It's an issue we can't put on the shelf. It's an issue we can't ignore. We need to grasp it biblically because God wants his people to act justly and to promote justice in this world. And God also wants us to love mercy because mercy lies so very heart to the close, to, excuse me, mercy lies so very close to the heart of God. Just a little farther on in Micah's book in chapter 7, Micah tells us that God delights to show mercy. He delights. God does not give mercy grudgingly. He looks for opportunities to be merciful. And he wants us to do the same. Now mercy is fascinating because in the Bible, mercy always is a form of rescue. 
It's rescue from deserved justice or rescue from undeserved injustice. Mercy is when we say, I know you wronged me, but I'm going to forgive you. Mercy is also when we say, I know you have been unfairly wronged, and I'm now willing to invest some of my time or my effort or my money to help set things right. You see, mercy involves some kind of sacrifice on our part. It's the right kind of sacrifice, not the wrong kind that Micah mentioned earlier. And here's where this gets really challenging. God's God's urge for us to love mercy lies in tension with his urge for us to act justly. And why is that? It's because loving mercy means that sometimes we will have to let go of our desire for justice. And it's not easy to do. It requires some humility. That's why God urges you and urges me to embrace a lifestyle where above all things we walk humbly with him. And if we're humble before God, then we will not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. In fact, we will be willing to consider the needs of others as equal to and sometimes even greater than our own. And for all of the reasons that Micah lays out here in this part of his prophecy, humility before God is a core characteristic. It is a foundational characteristic. It is the base upon which our character and behavior is built. And if we get this right, it will be reflected in the way that we respond to God. It will be reflected in the way that we treat others. If we make the decision to live humbly before God, then we will not put God on trial. Instead, we'll examine our own lives and discern where we have messed up. If we're humble, we won't try to appease God with sacrifices and offerings. Instead, we will give God things that flow out of our hearts. We will gladly give him of our time and our finances and our talent because our lives have been reshaped by humility. And as we walk humbly with God, we'll let him show us how to treat others with justice and with mercy. So God asks Micah to issue this prophecy to Israel. Because the people are at a point where they need to be corrected and humbled. And sometimes we too are at a point where we need to hear The prophetic call, the words of correction and humility. Because the reality is all of us at times can take certain things like offerings and sacrifices and we can substitute them for the pure joy of a life walking humbly with God. And what the Bible reveals in its totality is amazing and it is beautiful as we increasingly embrace humility, so many other aspects of life fall into place in a healthy way. Humility doesn't come easy. It's something that God's people need to learn and relearn continually. We don't grasp it in a day. We learn it in a lifetime, really. But we want to grow in this area, and so we are entering into a year of humility here at Gardenway Church. A year of learning to walk more humbly with God. And I have to tell you that as I stand here at this point, I have no idea exactly what that will look like. God has given me no master plan for this year. I just know that this is the direction he wants us to head. And we will have an opportunity to learn from him and from each other how to walk more humbly with God. And so in the year ahead, from time to time, we're going to open up the Bible and look more at what it says about humility. And we'll examine issues of pride and selfishness and stubbornness, those things that trip us up, those things that get in the way of a life of humility. 
And our theme verse for this year will be Micah 6 8. And so we will talk about how a life of humility can help us wrestle with the complex issues of justice and mercy. We've hung two banners out in the lobby to remind us of our theme for the year. I hope that you and I will enter into this with open and expectant hearts to see what God might do in our midst. And my hope is that 12 months from now, we will be different people. 12 months from now, we will be a different kind of community of faith. That 12 months from now, we will be changed because together we will have learned in a richer, deeper way how to walk humbly with God, individually and together. So as we enter into this year, here's my invitation. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to help each of us discern the answer to this foundational question. God, how do you want to reshape my life so that I can walk more humbly with you?